What a terrible first five minutes of the lecture. Let's make the next five minutes doubly fantastic. So on average, it's an okay lecture. Here we go. Are you ready? What makes everything twice as fantastic as normal? I hear you say lino. I have here lino. <laughs> uh, now we're going to use lino to understand binary numbers. There are two fundamental questions in this course that we'll keep coming back to over and over again in lots of different ways. Question one is this. How can a group of people, a team of people, work together to build a single thing? And it's not an academic question. It's one of the hardest questions facing mankind because it pops up everywhere. And ways of solving it pop up everywhere. And we can learn from other ways of solving it. We can move them normally from one situation to another. But it is essentially a really fundamental question. It's dear to my heart because my PhD thesis was in concurrency. And concurrency is this notion of how do you get many computers, which are very cheap, say buy 100 cheap computers, doesn't cost very much, if only we could join them into a computer that was 100 times as powerful. Because I can't, a computer that's 100 times as powerful costs more than 100 times the cost of a computer that's one times as powerful. So if you could somehow work out a way of joining multiple computers together so they can work together, you get, it's a very cheap way of getting incredible computing power. Uh, it used to fascinate me back in the 80s when I'd leave work and I'd notice that all around the building were just PCs sitting on people's desks not doing anything or doing, uh, displaying screensavers. And I'd been doing some intensive number crunching calculation and my machine had been flat chat for the last hour and I thought, if only I could somehow tap into all those machines around the place. And now there are various ways that people are starting to do that. But it's a problem we still haven't solved properly in computing. And it is, I think, the problem of computing. It's certainly the reason that Google is so successful. And we're going to hit that problem over and over again. So question one is, how can we get many people to work together to achieve one thing? I'm going to say that's the problem of concurrency. And problem number two, but again, it will pop up everywhere. How can it be? that, you know the difference between qualitative and quantitative? Qualitative is, well, let's start easier. Quantitative is, yeah, things you can measure in some way. Qualitative is, the rest. <laughs> yeah. Like, a picture weighs 20 grams. That's a quantitative piece of information about the picture. A picture is beautiful. That is a qualitative picture, piece of information about the picture. It's very easy to assess the quantitative. It's very hard to assess the qualitative. Now, computing, like maths, seems to live in the land of quantitative. It runs on a microprocessor, and the microprocessor does the same thing. Every time it sees that instruction, the increase by one or the jump instruction, it will do the same thing every time. And the things it does are all trivial and completely predictable. It's utterly fixed and controllable. There's no poetry or magic in a computer. It's just a mindless automaton carrying out stupid instructions at an incredible rate, but nonetheless, stupid instructions over and over again. So it appears to be entirely quantitative. But how can it be? Um, oh, what's the best way of saying this? Remember I was eating a bagel the other day? Oh, it was so delicious. I really love that bagel, that blueberry bagel. I haven't had lunch today, so I'm thinking fondly of that bagel. And the person that made that bagel followed a recipe. And the recipe is just quantitative. Get this amount of this and this amount of that and cook it for this long at this temperature, da, 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 da. How can it be that two people with the same recipe can produce different bagels? How can it be that when you cook, sometimes you produce beautiful things, whereas other people cook ostensibly with the same recipes, ostensibly perhaps in the same kitchen with the same ingredients, and produce food that's not fantastic? There's more to the recipe than people write down. Somehow, in a system, there are rules, there are descriptions that you never capture. If you've been carrying out the instructions so far to build those kits, you'll notice there's a whole lot of assumed steps that they've left out and a whole lot of unnecessary <laughs> steps that they've put in. <laughs> Somehow, uh, yeah, OK. So this quantitative thing is very, very interesting. So it's, again, this dilemma that we are talking about at the beginning, that at school everything seems black and white. And when you get to uni and move on to light, you see that actually things aren't black and white, they're shades of grey. And I'm really interested in this boundary between black and white and shades of grey. So we're going to see, for example, over and over again in this course, we'll be able to write two programs 
You'll write a, well, I'll write a program, you'll write a program. They'll both be correct and meet the specifications and be absolutely fine programs, but somehow, how can it be, I don't know, your program will be fantastic and mine will be terrible. How can it be the two programs that in some ways appear the same can be co completely different? There is this qualitative element to programming, which is completely unexpected if you're a maths person, um, but suddenly there's this notion of good and bad and better and worse. How can, that, how can that be? So we will look over and over again in the course, we'll see this thing keeps happening, that as you move up levels of abstraction, and as you move up levels of abstraction, you necessarily lose information, you hide things, there's certain rules you don't mention, certain things you don't do. Somehow as you move up the levels of abstraction, even if you start at a quantitative place, you can move up to a qualitative place. We're going to start with the black and white, and we're going to move up. A black and white. And I'm going to represent a number. Let's say we've got ones, twos, fours, eights, and sixteen. I want you to think of the number twenty. How can you build it out of these numbers? But I want you to each use each number once or zero times. How can you get twenty out of this? Can you think of a way of getting twenty out of this? All right, does it have a 1 in it? No. Does it have a 2 in it? No. Does it have a 3 in it, a 4 in it? Yes. Does it have an 8 in it? No. Does it have a 16 in it? Yes. So we could even represent it like this. We could say this is the number. Oh, oh, oh. thought we'd be able to pull it off. Hey, oh, would you mind being a volunteer? I don't know if you can hold them all on, but if you could somehow... Hold the white one there and the white one here. And, and also with your other arm, <laughs> it's, it's a black one here. Can you do that? Yeah. And I can, is, can you see past him? Yes. Could you just put your, <laughs> oh, what's your name? Uh, Jack. Jack. Yeah. Jack. Yes! Sweet. <laughs> Jack dot... Uh, Lazarus? Jack dot Lazarus gets a pixel. Okay, now, we'll just put two more on here. This is, can you see, the number 20? Does that make sense? Yeah. Alright, what's this number? Hang on, Jack, can I swap with you? Can everyone see this is the number 18? Is everyone cool? Is there anyone that doesn't get it? Oh, can we go up a bit? Can you? This is going to be hard. What's up? Your right foot on the green circle. On the green circle. <laughs> okay, what number is this? 18, you said that. Anyone not get it? Wave at me if you've got the least question. Okay, we're going to get, have another number now. Uh, what? Is everyone completely cool that's 19? Does everyone understand that you now know binary? Yes? So this is binary. 1, 0, 0, 1, 1 is binary for 20. 19. <laughs> is that right? Is everyone cool? Does anyone have a question about that? Only in or out. You can't have three of one of them. You can only have one or zero of them. That's binary. So there's got to be one. What's the binary for? Let me make it hard. What's the binary? No, call it out. What's the binary for 30? Don't call it out. We already worked out that 1, 0, 0, 1, 1 equals 19. And 1, 0, 0, oh, 1, 0, 0 equals 20. All right, now I want to know equals 30. Oh, oh, we'll do it digit by digit. What's the first digit, the most important digit, the biggest number? Is it a one or a zero? One. one. Well done. What's the second most important digit? One. one. I haven't even worked out the answer myself, but I'm believing you because I think that's right, actually. I have worked out the answer now. Um, next digit. Next digit. One. Next digit. Zero. Whoa. Well done. Okay. Here's a hard one. I want you to put up your hand when you've got it, but I don't want you to call it out. It's a race. Who knows the binary for? <laughs> one. 
Yes! <laughs> He's got to have a pixel. Um, who knows a binary for 40? Up, oh, fast, 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 fast. How do they do it? How do they do it? I'll show you the binary for 40 and see if you can work it out. The binary for 40 is... Zero, zero, one. Uh, sorry. <laughs> zero, one, one, zero, one. You see, what I was trying to do was uh, this. I just doubled everything. Because if it's got, if the 20 has a 1 and a 4 in it, then the 40 will have a 2 and an 8 in it. Yeah, you double all the parts, and then you double the total. Yeah. Does that make sense? You don't need to know that if it doesn't make sense. But. OK, so you know binary. Binary is pretty cool. And we did it with lino, so I'm going to call it linary. Linary uses black and white. Binary uses ones and zero. Here we are. We're at my profile page. No, we never got there. Oh, I, we left it a long time, and it still didn't get there. Let's give it another try. No? Yep, we're on my profile page. We're going to edit the page. And you can put stuff on the page about yourself, like I, I have a dog, a doig as I call him, called Bertie. He likes bones and beans. OK. And then you save it, and look, you've updated your page. You can also, on your page, change your profile picture if you don't like it. I don't know who this freak is. Let's just get rid of that, and we'll upload a real picture. There we go. So you can customize your picture. So please, everyone, do that to make your page as beautiful as can be. It'll have the Danish flag in all its glory. I love that flag. It does take a while to load, because it's so awesome. Normal flags load in seconds, but the computer's just reeling from the shock of... OK, so let's... There we are. Woohoo! Fantastic! Yeah. Puzzle Quest, strangely, you can't click on. I don't know why. Style Guide tells you how your programs have to look. Honors tells you all the people that have done this course or other courses I've taught in the past that have gone on to do amazing things. Uh, essentially, everyone that's come first in a course or done something amazing is listed there. And we'll be till the end of time or the internet or my quota running out. Talk and talk to your heart's content. Please go there a lot and ask questions and answer them because... The tutors and I read there all the time. So if you've got a question, don't wait a week. It, no matter what time of day or night it is, because we never sleep, just go there and ask the question, and I'll answer it straight away, and so will 50 other tutors. And then you'll have 51 different answers um, to your question, which is fantastic. Uh, the sandbox is where you can go and make sample wiki pages, so you can test how to create pages. If you not yet haven't worked out how to make pages, just go to the sandbox and make them, and no one cares what you do there. That's a disposable area. Let's write some code. Here... This is um, the program we were working on before. I've put in that I've started writing the program to detect if it's a leap year or not. Remember the rule for leap year is it's a leap year if it's divisible by four and also not divisible by 100 unless it's also divisible by 400. <laughs> it's a very crazy set of rules. You might want to look it up. Let's do some test cases so we, to check we fully understand those rules. What's uh, a year that is a leap year would be? 4,000. 4,000 is, what's another good test case? What's that? Isn't a leap year. I think, I think you'll find it is. What about 4,004? That deserves multiple ticks. Uh, what about 119, 1,999? Leap year? No. Shh. What about 1,900? No. What about 2,000? Yeah. All right. Good. So there's, we've got some test cases. So when we write our program, we should certainly stick those in to make sure um, that the program works. And it's good to write the test cases up front because that helps you understand what the problem's really asking. Here's a simple program. Let's look at how it works. It says there's a magic number. Please enter a number less than 9,000. That doesn't make sense anymore, does it? I copied that from the old program. What do we want them to enter? They're entering a year, not a number. Please enter... the year you are interested in, in which you are interested in. Um, all right, and they're going to read in a magic number. Is that a good name for it? No, it doesn't really make sense, does it? We might as well call it X or something stupid like that if we're going to call it magic number. What should we call it? Yeah. It's a year. We should call it year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What can't we call it? You can't call it 12 because it collides with the number. What else can't you call it? 
slash n. That would be confusing. <laughs> I don't even know if you can do that, but you shouldn't be able to. <laughs> I'm going to try. No. It doesn't start with a letter. Uh, it's got to start with a letter. Well, well OK. What else can't we call it? Exit success. Exit success. Um, oh, that would be confusing. Yes. <laughs> we can't call it exit success. Well done. I hadn't thought of that. What else can't we call it? What's that? Main. We can't call it main. Well, we actually, we probably could, but is that a good idea? No, you're asking for confusion there. Print F. But I'm, I'm hunting for another one. Return. Yeah, a keyword from the language. Remember, print F something that we loaded in from another file. Exit success is something we hash to find. But something that's part of the language, yeah, that's reserved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That needs to be escaped. So you can't call it, you can't call it if, for example. Well, no, you can't. You just can't do it. Okay, so here we go. We're going to call it year, which I think is a particularly good name because it's both descriptive, short, and hard to spell wrongly. Spelling things wrongly is a very bad programming mistake, especially if your compiler doesn't tell you because you think you're talking about the thing you were talking about two lines ago, but if you spelt it differently by times, they're separate entities. You can call an int an int? Ah, that's fantastic. But who would do that? <laughs> But you can, yeah. There is an actual an annual competition called the obfuscated C competition. Obfuscated means make confusing, where people put in programs that are deliberately written to be very confusing. And it's quite amazing some of the amazing confusing programs they put in. We might show you some later on. But our aim in this course is the opposite, to lose that competition the most spectacularly. We want you to write clear programs. Is divisible by four, it's not how you spell by, uh, yeah, yeah, is a leap year would be heaps better, wouldn't it? The magic number was... This is much better program now. Making more sense. Let's run it. Please enter the year you're interested in is... 4,000. And what's the answer I'm expecting? And what does it say? It's divisible by... It's not telling me the answer I asked for, is it? But there's the program running. It's telling me it's divisible by 100. It's divisible by 100 factorial, which is pretty cool. It's divisible by 4. <laughs> And the year's 4,000. Where, where would I print out, if we're just looking at the first two tests, the, the divisible by 100, divisible by 4, let's suppose we don't care about this last one, wherever it is. I've rubbed it out, it's gone. So we're interested in this case. That's a special case, so we better not think about it. We're interested in this case and this case. I just want to handle those cases. So I want to get the divisible by 4 thing working. So if it's divisible by 4, what do I need to print out? Is a... Leap year. Let's, let's just get it working for that first case, first of all. So we're just handling the divisible by four thing. That's not going to pass all our tests, but it'll pass some of them. Let's have a look. Enter the year you're interested in, 1999. Woohoo! The year is 1999. Oh. oh, no, it's not a leap year. That's right. Oh, we wanted to print is not a leap year. Uh, else... Is not a leap year. The year I'm interested in is 1999. It's not a leap year. The year was 1999. Okay, I don't need that last line, probably, do I? Kill that. So, it's not a leap year. That's working. Now I want to handle the case. Ooh, now I want to handle the case where. We're considering divisible by 100 as well. If the year is divisible by 100, what do I print? And if it's divisible, not divisible by 100, what do I print? So I really want to do this. Is that right? Is this a beautiful program now? It's less than beautiful. What have I done that makes it slightly less than beautiful? What's that? I've got some duplication. We never like duplication. But it's still going to be correct, so let's leave it like it is. But I've got this niggling worry in my mind. Ooh, uh, that was a bit messy. Because I've said, basically I've said is, is not a leap year twice. I shouldn't have said that twice. Please enter the year you're interested in is 1999. Yes, not a leap year. Woohoo! All right, run again. Uh, 1900. Is not a leap year. Woohoo! 
And mind you, a program that simply printed is not a leap year would be passing these tests. We should probably check that it can detect one that is a leap year. So let's say 1904 is a leap year. All right, it's looking better. So my challenge for you is to finish that off and get that working completely correctly um, for all four cases, all the three cases, all the three rules: the divisible by 400, divisible by uh, 100, and divisible by four. Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. Do we want to check if the user entered a valid number? Yeah, that's a good question. Who's responsible for the user typing something wrong in? Let's have two schools of thought. This school of thought is it's the user's problem. This school of thought is it's the programmer's problem. Uh, which school do you want to start in? Oh, we're lazy. Let's start in the one where it's someone else's problem. It's a user's problem. If they type the wrong thing in, I can't anticipate that. I'm writing a program to detect leap years, not a program to check valid input. I don't want to waste all my time checking that their input's right. Oh, no, you do. Uh, over here. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so the problem is the users will type wrong input. And the users aren't necessarily people using programs. They could be just other programs using your programmers, using your functions. And it could be you. You could be a user of your own program in three years' time. You suddenly need a function you wrote three years ago. You grab it and stick it in, but you don't do it right. You pass the wrong thing into it. You could be a nasty person trying to break it, in fact. And nasty people trying to break things look for mistakes in your programs and exploit them to take over your computer. Here's the problem with the programmer taking care of it. The programmer has to reduce a whole lot of extra logic to deal with errors. And they may have to do this redundantly over and over again because you never know who's going to be calling your function and who's not. So although the input might have already been checked that it's sane by the previous function that had it, you, you don't know that inside the function you're writing now. So the only safe thing to do is if you're going to check, you have to check everywhere. Whenever you call a function, you have to check. So you might find the user types a number and it gets checked 50 times. It's a tricky problem. And also, the logic of checking it can make your program more complex. And what's the problem with a more pomp complex program? More likely to have an error. Yeah, yeah. Complexity is our enemy. Simplicity. You look at something. This is why I like white in Lino. Okay? It's simple and white, and everything's clean and clear and crisp. And if there's a bit of, um, say, dog poo on it, you can just walk into the kitchen straight away and go, Bertie! <laughs> Whereas if your floor's all complex, like an RSL club Lino pattern, <laughs> You could walk in and not even notice. Okay. So the same with your program. If your program's all clean and crisp and clear and short and to the point and self-explanatory, if it's got a mistake in it, you'll glance at it and just see. But if it's complicated and messy and confusing and you have to be a real genius to understand it, errors can be hiding in there and no one will ever see them. So we like clean, clear programs. We don't like confusing them and confounding them up with um, extraneous testing for input when the point of the function isn't testing the input. The point of the function is working out if something's a leap year or not. Yeah, 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 absolutely. But it, might, it, might, it just might not be done. You can't, as, if you're writing a function, you can't trust that someone else has done it. So our normal approach is this. When we write a function, we try and make the function just do what it's supposed to do. And every time you're asking for input and there's a chance the user's doing something wrong, then work as hard as you can to detect it. Know full well that mistakes might percolate through the system. And our approach in this course is we don't have to do anything sensible with them, but we do have to detect when things are off the rails. So if you've got a function, leap year, and leap years are only, it's only valid to do this calculation when the Gregorian calendar is in force, right? The Gregorian calendar, the whole idea of putting these extra adjustments in for leap years, that didn't happen until 15 something. Can someone look it up? 15 what? Is someone looking it up? Gregorian calendar? 15? You made it up? What did you make up? 1503! Okay, my good man. So it's invalid to ask for a, if a year's a leap year before 1503. This formula we've got won't work. There's two ways we can deal with this problem. One is we put a comment at the top and say, notice this only works if the year is greater than or equal to 1503 because of the Gregorian calendar stuff. OK. And then you could say, well, I wash my hands of it. I've told the kids not to play with those razor blades. <laughs> so this is better than nothing. At least you've made a remark that your program is only well-defined if the input is greater than or equal to 1503. 
I don't want you putting ifs in and printing helpful error messages out if it is greater than 15. I don't want you doing that. That's going to confuse your program. But actually, I think you should detect if, it's, if it is a number less than 1503, because that could cause subtle errors to creep into the system. So we want to, as soon as something goes wrong, we want to just abort out. So what we do in this course is we assert. And you say, assert year is greater than or equal to 1503. This performs a similar function to the comment in that it alerts people reading your program, it alerts them to the fact that there's this critical number and the year has to be greater than it. But it's also more useful than that because at runtime, if someone types something wrong in your program, we'll spit the dummy and say, no, something's wrong. So your program is only guaranteed to be correct and work if the year is greater than 1503. 1582. 1582, I meant, actually. 1582. And now if I'm going to compile it now, it's not going to like that. I'm going to get an error message. This is a message you'll see a lot, so pay attention to it. Warning. Do you remember seeing this before, actually? Implicit declaration of function assert. When did you see that last? Printf. printf. What did it mean when we got it for printf? We were, yeah, we were talking about printf. The program didn't know about printf. We had to include a file that told it about printf. Similarly, we have to import a file that tells it about assert. Can you guess what that file might be called? Assert. Assert.h. There we are. Work. Enter the year you're interested in. Let's type a wrong year just so we can check it. Let's type a small, a small year. 14. Thank you. Assert failed. Blah, debugger, blah, crash, crash, crash. <laughs> but at the very top, before all that stuff happened, it printed out what line we failed on and the reason. And that's really useful when you're testing your code. OK. So you normally protect your functions on the input by asserting what we call the preconditions. Asserting the things that you hope are true, that you assume are true, assert that they are true. The things you need to be true, assert they're true. OK, um, we've nearly finished. There's just one more thing I wanted to show you. This number, 1582, what is that number? It's a, it's a constant. What does it mean? I'm reading through the code. I'm thinking, I'm reading your program. You wrote this program. Oh, is it Alan? Adam. I'm reading Adam's program, and I'm going, everything made sense until I saw 1582. It's got something to do with the Gregorian calendar, because Alan was really good and he put a comment there. But I'm thinking, what does it have to do with the Gregorian calendar? And I look it up and he got it wrong. The Gregor it's, well, I don't know if he got it wrong, but the, the, the thing says the Gregorian calendar actually started in 1583. Now, what am I going to do now? Yeah, where am I going to change it, though? I could change it here, but Alan spent a year with us before he left. He wrote every calendar function in this software calendar company. There could be hundreds of 1582s everywhere. Most of them probably need to be changed to 1583s. Only problem is our most popular calendar is model 1582. So if I just systematically go through every program is written and change every 1582 to 1583, I might change some of the ordering software that's ordering calendar number 1582 to order calendar 1583. And you don't want calendar 1583, I can tell you that. So it's quite hard to maintain and change this, and also the name itself doesn't tell much meaning as to what's going on, though the comment above is, helps fix that problem. <laughs> so we have a way of solving that problem in C, which you've already seen. Has anyone, does anyone, I'll just go down here. Anyone see how we change a number into a word that means something? Yeah. No, look, 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 here. Exit success. Remember we did that? We defined, or in that case the program defined a constant with a name. We can define our own constants. We just go hash define. Start of Greg calendar. And that's 1582. Now what this does is lines beginning with a hash. This is similar to the hash include. Remember before the program's compiled, the, the pre-compiler quickly inserts these three files in these three places. So it massively expands the size of this file. Then if it sees a hash define, it reads quickly through everything underneath that line. And wherever it sees start of Gregorian calendar, it replaces it with the number 1582. And that lets me everywhere in my program that wants start of Gregorian calendar, or at least in this file now, to write start of Greg calendar. If the year is greater than or equal to the start, assert the year is greater than or equal to the start of the Greg calendar. Do you see already the program's starting to look a bit cleaner and clearer? I mean, it makes a bit more sense. And, if you, and I'll compile it and check it still works. What were our test cases? Should retest it, shouldn't I? Check it still works. The test cases were 1999, not a leap year. And 1900, not a leap year. And 1500, well, that's. 
Uh, that's in the third era, thank you. I was surprised by that. And uh, what is a leap year? 2012. Oh, and 2012. <laughs> is a leap year. Okay, so the program at least hasn't been broken any more than it was before. Is that cool? Can, so they're called magic numbers. Whenever you see a constant just sitting in your code, it doesn't really mean much just by itself. So we normally replace it with a named thing and pick a name that means something and then we hash to find it at the top. Can you see any other magic numbers in here? The four, the 100, even the zero is sometimes regarded as a magic number, though most people when they're looking at zero sort of know what it means. So you might even want to redefine those. It's hard to think of good words for those. That's a challenge for you. Yes? What's the advantage of um, defining at the top like that rather than just, you know, how we um, made space for like an F? Ah, that's a good question. What's your name? Mark was asking, there's another way we could have done this. We could have said this. We could have said int, start of Gregorian calendar. This would work. I kind of have both in there. It'll get a bit confused. They're different. Let's talk about those two different approaches. Approach number one just went through the program, and wherever that word appeared, stuck the number in there as a constant. Approach number two, and that happens at compile time. When it's compiling the program, it sticks that number in. Approach number two happens at runtime, when you're running the program. The program starts, it does this line, oh, I'll set some memory aside for a year. Then it gets to this line, it goes, oh, okay, I'll set some memory aside for this variable called start of the year. Then it writes a value into that. So it's a bit slower because it's happening at runtime. It consumes a bit of memory because it's having to set memory aside for a while. But the real problem with it is, I think, that now it's in a piece of memory, it's what we call a variable, and what can happen to it? It can change. Someone can affect it. Normally, magic numbers are constants. They're, they're special numbers that mean something. The number of meters in a kilometer, the number of inches in a foot. It's some sort of constant. That's right. Things that don't change. You see, things that you don't want to change, if you hash to find them, they never will change because that number is literally inserted everywhere. As soon as you make something a variable, it opens a possibility of it being changed. And it's communicating to the reader of the program, here is something that might change. So the reader now looking at this program is thinking, I've got to keep track of that variable and I've got to keep track of every line before the line I'm at now to see if it's changed it in any way at all. It makes understanding it much harder. Or it's a constant, you just know it hasn't changed. Does that answer? It's a perfect question. Yes? Oh, what happens if you write the defined thing and... Ah, if I write the defined thing and this, um, well, you guys tell me, what's going to happen? Think about it. Yep. To replace the word started break calendar. Yes. It's going to start, the compiler starts at the top and goes down. So, it, it, it'll, first of all, it'll see this in, in hash include here and it'll insert that whole file there. Then it'll see this hash include and it'll insert that whole file there. Then it'll see this hash include and it'll insert that file there. Then it'll see hash define and it'll, it'll think, okay, I'm going to just quickly scan through the rest of the program and every line that I find that contains start of Greg calendar, I'm going to replace it with the number 1582. So it's going to come down to here, do nothing, do nothing, do nothing. This is the compiling step. We're not running it yet. It's just converting it into machine code. And it gets to here, and this is what's going to kill us. It's going to change it to 1582. So we're going to say int 1582. We've got a variable called 1582 that stores an integer. And C only lets you call, have variables whose names start with a letter or an underscore. So it's going to say, well, that's not a valid idea. Well, let's see what it says. I'm not even going to try and guess what it says. Let's compile it and see. Syntax error before numeric constant. Oh, that's confusing, isn't it? You'd never understand it from that. Because it turns it into a number, yeah. and then it's confused because there's an int before a number, and it's not supposed to see an int, so it's saying there's an error before a constant. You can't even see the constant there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, all make sense? Yeah. Everything's cool. Error, assigning to a to a I'm assigning a number to a number, but yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, and there could be hundreds of errors. That's right. Um, all right. Yes, question. Do the names have to be in caps? Ah, good question. Do the names have to be in capitals? Yes and no. Yes in the sense that if you've done them in caps in one spot, they've got to be caps everywhere because C, it doesn't mind what case you pick, but whatever you pick, you've got to stick to it. If you defined it in uppercase in one spot, lowercase in another, I'd think you're talking about two different things. No in that C doesn't care at all about case, but yes in that our convention in this course is following a particular style guide, and our style guide is you write all constants in uppercase caps separated by underscores, and then that way glancing through a program you can quickly see when something's a constant. You write all other variables in entirely in initial... Uh, Start, all other variables start with a lowercase initial letter, unless they're a special sort of variable we'll see later on. So we actually use the casing of letters to communicate stuff to us. But right now, make all your variables lowercase and your constants uppercase. 
If you then put start of Greg calendar in as a, um, a value when you're running the program, would it put in 15... Great question. The question was, what happens if at runtime you typed in, it's asking for a number, and you wrote in start of Greg calendar? Would it know what number that means? The answer is no, and there's a subtle reason for that. Can anyone think what it is? Because it goes through and finds start of Greg calendar at the start, like... Yes, 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 he's got it. Yeah, yeah. The words get replaced at compile time. When you convert it to machine code, all the hash things are gone at compile time. So they're, when it's building the program, when it's turning the C into machine code, when you run GCC, that turns the C into machine code. But you don't type the user data in till it's run time, till the program's running. So yeah, yeah. Oh, hi, guys. There are some lecture notes here for the last lecture. They're my slides. But I hope someone's going to write, make them all nice and pretty. Uh, so, oh, admin, Shane Brainer. Uh, during the break, can Shane Brainer come and see me, please? I haven't seen him. He hasn't turned up. We're a bit worried about him. Two big questions. How can a group or team work together to produce a single thing, concurrency? And if two programs are correct, how can one be better than the other, a.k.a. cooking bagels? Both questions that we'll come back to over and over again. I wanted them in your mind, though, straight away. Gregorian calendar, we've talked about. Asserts, we've talked about. Binary, we've talked about. Uh, functions and irrationality. All right. Let me just talk quickly about irrationality. When... Uh, when I first met Julian, Julian Sacknusen is his name, however you spell that, weird but delightful spelling, um, I always thought he was a bit weird because he used to say that uh, he was on the run and he was just working on here because he was on the run, he was in hiding. Uh, he had apparently uncovered some sort of weird conspiracy. So let me tell you and you just decide what you think about it. He said that um, he used to work for PayPal. Now, PayPal, as you know, is an awesome company, and they're really good. Uh, they're one of the few people bold enough to stand up for the US government uh, against uh, WikiLeaks and Bradley Manning. Uh, they, um, they're in there punching for the underdog, and I like that about them. But he discovered something strange about them. He said, when he used to work there, he looked through their code, and he discovered that their billings, when PayPal bills people, all their calculations are in irrational numbers. Do you know what irrational numbers are? Non-repeating decimals, essentially. They go on forever, infinite, but non-repeating. Because of the way they do financial calculations, they're always taking square roots of things, pi appears all the time. So just naturally, all the calculations they're doing are irrational numbers. But computers can only store rational numbers. In fact, to be precise, fixed length decimals that terminate. So in all the calculations, over and over again, there's always a rounding error. And he noticed that PayPal always rounded everything down. <laughs> now, admittedly, the difference between an irrational number and the nearest rational number can be quite small. But there's so many transactions going on and on and on and again that sometimes if you add together a whole lot of small things, you can get a big thing. Yeah, that's integration. He started trying to work out what had happened to all the money. He's disappeared now. I don't know what's happened to him. <laughs> he used to call it, this thing he was hunting for, irrational treasure. <laughs> so, I don't know. If anyone finds out anything about it, please tell me. <laughs>